something that we've heard about a little bit over the course of the past couple of days. Uh, we think there's a lot of promise there. There's a lot of new technologies out there that, uh, that, and this is a really growing market where there's more opportunities to be able to give people these types of devices, be able to track it, and be able to provide feedback. Um, in addition to this, there's also the pro proliferation of wireless and mobile devices that can be tethered to these types of devices. So some examples of, that you've all heard about are the jawbone to measure activity, uh, um, glow caps to measure medication adherence, and there's also going to be probably more technologies that, that are even better than just measuring the, the cap adherence, things that you can actually measure if people ingest it or not. Uh, there's glucometers that, that can transmit their data wirelessly to a variety of different third party users, and then there's pacemakers that are actually implanted into patients right now and have the potential to transmit these devices. So these are all devices that measure either health status or behavior and can transmit it to a variety of different third parties, whether it's providers, whether it's insurance companies, or even the manufacturers that keep track of this data. Because we all know that our data is being tracked with everything that we do, whether it's email or whether it's websites or things like that. So you can imagine that this could translate, you know, as, as we have more of these health-related devices, more and more people could be monitoring these things, which is more the reason to think about the ethical ramifications of it. So everyone's heard about the Apple Watch, and uh, we think that there's implications to this, uh, probably beyond the fact that Apple Watches are cool and all Apple devices are amazing and everyone should have them um, just because Apple creates it. Uh, but we think there's actually some additional uh, ramifications to it. One is that it actually provides for continuous monitoring uh, in a device that you use all the time. It's not like a phone where you can keep the phone in your pocket, you can take it out. People will often sleep with their watches, so uh, in, continuous, in a continuous fashion, you can monitor their activity through accelerometers, you can monitor sleep, uh, and you can also monitor heart rate, which is also quite interesting. There's also uh, the potential for an expansion of a potential market size. So right now, most people that use these types of activity monitors are people that are really interested in that because they're basically creating a, a new device that they wear, while watches are things that people have all the time. Um, so as people buy Apple Watches for a variety of reasons, uh, the example is that my parents have an iPhone, yet they only use it for text messaging. They don't really use any of the capabilities of it. So people may buy these watches not really realizing that, uh, that it can monitor all of these things. And finally, there's the opportunity for the health kit, which allows for transmission of this data to these third party uh, entities and specifically to providers. So there's going to be the potential for more seamless communication of these types of things. So if we think about the opportunities from a societal standpoint for these types of devices and particularly for the transmitting of information for these devices, the first one is, is relatively obvious. It's to improve self-management of disease and this allows for more automation to give you feedback about things and make these diseases more salient to you in the present sense. So you know exactly if you're using this uh, CPAP monitor, you know if you're taking medications, you know if you're, uh, if you're actually walking or, or doing activity. So it gives you that immediate feedback to help overcome decision errors. Uh, the second is to improve provider capacity. So providers we know are incredibly busy and they have lots of patients and lots of competing demands. So these, this type of monitoring allows us to move beyond this visit-based reactive model to one that we can monitor what's going on with patients uh, in real time at any time. And this will allow us to detect things potentially earlier, to automate those things, and to potentially uh, in increase the capacity of providers if we leverage the technology efficiently. And then finally, this one's probably the most controversial, which is that it could potentially be used as a way sort of for sort of fairness of resource allocation from uh, either a provider, uh, um, either an employer or an insurer in terms of trans transferring uh, funds or money from one entity to another. So a couple of examples are that the ACA permits uh, rewards and penalties for, uh, for use of biometric data. So you can imagine that people that may not walk a certain amount may be penalized and people that walk more could be getting incentives, which in some senses could do those first two things, but could also potentially transfer funds from people that, are, that have a lower health status to people that potentially have a higher health status. And the last one is that insurance companies, uh, there's some examples of insurance companies doing this already, which is that they give you a CPAP monitor, they monitor that adherence, and they'll take it away from you if you're actually not using it. So that's a reflection of the fact that they can actually sense if you're using it or not. 
And to come back to this all exciting Apple Watch, we have no interest to declare, by the way. Um, one of the amazing things this watch does is that it allows you to send your heartbeat. So here you have Jane and Alex. Alex can say, Jane, send me your heartbeat. Jane just goes like this, send your heartbeat. That's very romantic in the 21st century <laughs> sense of romance. But it could be that Alex is actually the health plan representative, right? That's maybe not so uh, romantic, but <laughs> unless you have that relationship with your health plan. Um, but interestingly, this report by the Robert Johnson Foundation that mainly looked at people who are already using these devices found that a third is already sharing data from uh, connected health devices with their health plan users. And more than 90% were willing to share this data for research, which is something else that we think is a, a great opportunity here, but that we want to get right so that people don't get nervous about people accessing the data and reject all access to data. Now, the key condition for people providing access was that there would be consent, uh, confidentiality, and privacy in line with uh, the, the legal framework. We're setting that aside, that's a necessary condition, but obviously that needs to be given. So those, however, are, and Siobhan alluded to that already, there are a lot of uh, quantified selfers among those who are just quite narcissistic about this and would love somebody to look at their data. But then we have people like, say, uh, Jack, who's uh, Jane's brother, who is not so keen on having his data access. So the question is, how do we go about deciding whether we collect this kind of data? So. Firstly, you could argue, and a lot of bioethicists will take this view, well look, respecting autonomy and liberty and privacy means let people use those things, but leave it up to them. We're all adults, we know what to do, don't coerce them into any of these things. So we think that's not a good idea, A, because of the known behavioral economics insights that suggest oftentimes you can only empower people to really become autonomous by doing a little bit more. And then secondly, there's really a spectrum of different things that you can do. So sure, you can just uh, leave people to buy them on the market, but you can also, as some health plans and employers do, give them away, which comes with a bit more encouragement, or you can have a health care professional who recommends it. You can layer rewards or penalties, um, you can, which is something that a lot of employers do for health risk assessment. You can say you only get our health plan if you use one of these devices. And then you can do the, the things where you simply have no option uh, if you use the device other than having your data transmitted, such as linking it to a CPAP machine or a pacemaker. So the criteria that we think are useful for thinking about collecting data that goes beyond leaving it to people to voluntarily opt in are firstly, and this is again a necessary condition, clinical utility. Now you would say trivially so, but there's about 100,000 health apps out on the market of which the FDA looked at um, 100. So that's not a good cut and you can't take it for granted that that happens. So clearly the higher the clinical utility, the stronger you have a case. Then there's the severity of a health risk clearly with a pedometer that's less relevant than with, say, a pacemaker, where monitoring some arrhythmias may be more relevant. Again, the higher the health risk and having access to the data, the better your case. Intrusion has really three dimensions. One, it's about what data you collect. Some data will be more sensitive than other. Second, about how you collect the data. So some of the adherence, pill adherence devices, for example, come in the form of a necklace, which can be a little bit stigmatizing to people, especially maybe if you make them tighter if you're a little late with taking your pills. Um, I was joking there, but obviously, uh, just to make it clear, obviously it, different devices will be received differently. And then there's this question about very high incentives that can again be perceived as more intrusive. Then there's opportunity of choice, and this really means that not everybody is equally able to do the things on which you collect data. So on pedometers, for example, for some people it'll be easy to walk a million steps a year because they do that already anyway. For others it'll be a huge challenge, and for some in between it might be just the right kind of nudge to change their behavior. So again, the better you have opportunity of choice, the more you can uh, go beyond voluntary use. And then there's cost impact, which I think is, uh, shouldn't be the driving force, but it's clear that in a uh, health plan situation, we are in a sense in a contractualist arrangement where we're all in it together. So there are, there's a prima facie obligation that you can say that people have to contribute to controlling cost. So all of those things together, um, we would suggest need to be seen in a, in a holistic sense so that there's proportionality both within each dimension so that it goes in the right direction and if you have very low scoring on one criteria, the other ones need to make up for that. And I will very briefly apply that to a couple of cases. So in thinking about some of these criteria, they seem relatively abstract. So what was really useful for Harold and I to, uh, to do was really to think about some clinical scenarios and to kind of sort of lay out the, the, the foundation for 
and how it would fit into some of these different criteria. Um, and, and in terms of not just understanding where we think it should be, but thinking about potential policy levers that you could uh, apply uh, in terms of, from a sort of behavioral economic standpoint, moving from things that are much more passive in that you can only opt in to participate to things that potentially could even be mandatory, to say that if we're gonna give you this device, uh, we will only allow you to use it if we're able to track and monitor what happens. So the first one is a pedometer. Um, so an insurance company or an employer could uh, provide pedometers and basically give incentives uh, to patients to be able to increase their activity. So from a clinical utility standpoint, it's sort of uh, you know, mild to moderate or low to moderate in that there are certain benefits to walking, but it's not clear uh, from an evidence standpoint that actually getting people to walk more will have a huge dramatic impact on their health outcomes. It's definitely positive, but the question is how will it impact um, you know, their long-term benefits? The second is thinking about the severity of health risk. So uh, we want people to walk, but if they don't walk, it's actually fine. It's probably not life-threatening in the immediate sense as compared to other diseases that we may follow. Uh, the third one is thinking about intrusion uh, in that it, it is something you actively have to use, so it could be seen as potentially more intrusive, although with more technologies that are embedded into your actual devices that you have, it may sort of, sort of transition to being a little bit less intrusive. Uh, the last couple are opportunity of choice. We think that there could be a wide range in terms of opportunity of choice. If it's just a matter of walking some steps, most people can do that. If it's a matter of walking 20,000 steps a day, that might be a lot more challenging for for patients and, and for beneficiaries to participate in. And finally, from a cost impact, if you get people to walk more, you're probably not gonna see those immediate cost gains right away. So, so we thought that an appropriate policy would be to have voluntary use, and we actually had some disagreements about whether you can actually give incentives or not. I thought it's reasonable to give incentives in this realm. Um, Harold was a little bit more uh, pessimistic about that. Um, so this really is a work in progress. So we'd love to kind of hear your feedback at the end. Uh, the second one was a glucometer to measure your, your blood sugar, and this is for diabetic patients. This is something that exists already, but can you tether this or transmit this to providers? So from a clinical utility standpoint, there's certainly lots of utility to checking your blood sugar and doing things to remediate that. Uh, from a severity of disease, it's definitely more severe than just walking for, you know, sort of for general participants. Um, and there could be some, some uh, dangers to be either, either having hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. From an uh, intrusion standpoint, you still have to actively participate in it, so perhaps it seems a little bit more intrusive. And from a, a cost impact, there's definitely more cost impact than, uh, than walking. So if you can get people to control their blood sugars, you can certainly see some uh, potential cost benefits in more in the near term. So we thought that in this situation, perhaps a policy lever is to say that you provide these devices, the default would be that they do have to transmit it to their provider, but in some circumstances, if there's the right reasons for it, they could potentially opt out. And you can also imagine that how you incentivize it, if you provide, let's say, financial incentives to just use it, that could be very different than financial incentives to actually improve upon, uh, improve upon your, your health status. And the last one quickly is a pacemaker, which has, we think has higher clinical utility, higher severity of disease, because those participants uh, could, actually, uh, could actually end up in the hospital and could be very severe. Uh, it's less intrusive in that it's embedded in your body, so you wouldn't have any, uh, any uh, uh, you, couldn't, you wouldn't have to do anything to participate. So we thought that in this situation, if you were to provide a pacemaker, you'd want to make it more mandatory. And you would almost say, we'd only provide you if we could track this, because we think it's really dangerous. And we'll let you read the conclusions because otherwise Gerald is going to hate us forever because we're a little over the time.